If you brought a Bible this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2, the great Pentecost chapter of the Bible, Acts chapter 2. I've got a message uh, today, may get through it all today, may take next week as well, but I've got a message that I've titled, Come Back to the fire, come back to the fire, uh, dealing with how essential it is for us to experience personal revival, uh, keep ourselves close to the fire, you know, so you don't grow cold. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. That would have been an interesting place to be, don't you think? When that sound comes roaring through, reverberating through the the walls of the house. And verse 3, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know, this is the account according to all biblical, I want to say the majority of conservative biblical teachers, scholars, Bible students, this is where the New Testament church was born. It was born on the day of Pentecost, and it was born in fire. That's very important for us to see. Uh, Verse 3 relates this incredible supernatural occurrence. Not only did this sound of a rushing mighty wind fill all the house, But besides this sound that that we can only try to imagine, notice what verse 3 says, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Now, the only way you can picture this or depict this is that along with the sound of wind rushing through the whole place, imagine now a whirlwind of fire that came through and it was visible. They saw it, and it rushed in and swirled around a mighty torrent of fire, and then parts of the fire broke off, and 120 people had a part of that fire individually broken off, separated, and lighting on them. It sat, the Bible says, on each of them. So... This is quite the whirlwind. This is quite the occurrence. The church was born in a supernatural work of God, a work of fire right here. The Holy Spirit descended in Acts chapter 2, not as a dove, not as a dove, but as fire. This is how the Holy Spirit came. Heat, flame, fire, power. There's something terrifying about fire, especially something uncontrolled, something you have no control over. There is something very terrifying about it. At the same time, there's something fascinating about fire, something that draws us to it. It's, it, it, appeal, it appeals to something in us. And while at the same time it can be horrifying, it can also be fascinating. And in in some spiritual sense, this is what we see as fire just swept through this upper room and uh, swirled all around and then separated itself and sat on 120 different individual people. Every single person present had the fire of God sit upon them. That's a prayer meeting you would not want to have missed. It would have been tragic if you had been absent that that day for prayer. Just can't get there today, you know, or tonight for prayer. That would have been tragic, right? Because the Holy Spirit descended on a prayer meeting. They were, they were gathered together. They were in unison. And they were praying. 
and the Holy Spirit descended in this supernatural way. You know, fire is how God often manifested himself in the Bible. In Acts, uh, uh, in, not only in the book of Acts, but also all the way back in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3, remember the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush. In fact, I want to read a verse to you. Listen to this. The Bible says, I'm in Exodus 3, 2. You don't have to turn there, but it says, And the angel of the Lord. Now, that's nobody but the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Moses said, I have to turn aside and see this. It's the Lord himself appeared as a flame of fire. There's another very interesting passage in the book of Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to read a few verses beginning in Exodus 19:16. I want you to listen carefully to these words. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Now, this is Mount Sinai. This is Moses where he's got the people of Israel all assembled and God is going to speak to them from the mountain. This now, the Bible says the voice of a trumpet came from that mountain exceeding loud. It caused everybody to tremble. The Bible says, beginning in verse 17, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood in the lower part of the mount and Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. The Lord descended on that mountain in a fire. Smoke, flame, trembling of the earth. They knew that that was God there. The fire, the present, it it, it just revealed and signified the very presence of God himself. So while it was terrifying, it was at the same time awe-inspiring. It was frightening, but at the same time, it was fascinating because they knew God was in that fire. God came in fire, both in the Old Testament, and we see it again over here in the book of Acts in the New Testament. It's interesting that in the Old Testament, God came in fire as a new nation, a new people was being born. And in the New Testament, God came in fire as the church of Jesus Christ was being born. Isn't that something? That fire signified the power that would be necessary, the presence that would be necessary, not only to give birth, but to sustain life. Both Exodus And Acts, I like the idea that just as the nation of Israel itself was basically birthed in fire, so the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was birthed in fire. 120 people in that upper room. That's all there was, 120. And every single one of them, the fire set upon their heads, and every one of them were changed forever. This is on, right? Y'all can hear me in the back? Okay. How about 120 people full of the fire, passion, zeal of the Holy Ghost? 120 people who would never, ever be the same again. You know, that very day, Peter, now filled with this powerful Holy Spirit, Peter preached to, you still in Acts chapter 2? He preached to thousands of people that very day. And with a boldness that was born in this fire, he told them they needed to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, and if you will, you'll be filled with the same Holy Spirit. Let me read beginning in verse 37, Acts 2, 37. Now, when they heard this, they heard his message. They were pricked in their heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, repent. That's what you need to do. 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as our Lord God shall call. The Bible says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation, urging them, you've got to come out of this crooked generation, this perverse generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and prayers, God moved among them, right? Yep. Here's an interesting uh, thought I'd like to add to this. God moved among them not only with signs and wonders outwardly, because the Lord was healing. He's, I mean, the sick were getting healed. He moved outwardly. Tremendous miracles of God took place. But you know, the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, He not only moves in signs and wonders outwardly, He moves in signs and wonders inwardly. Inside of a person's life, inside the human heart, the Holy Spirit moves and, and does dramatic things. You know, in verse 43, it says, Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. So we know the Holy Spirit is moving outwardly. But what about the dramatic change that takes place inwardly in human lives when the Holy Spirit moves in such powerful ways? For instance... Greedy people became generous. Selfish people became givers. You're in Acts chapter 2, verse 44. All that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. Ha! Huh. These were Jews. Let's not forget that little fact. Jews in Jerusalem who now got filled with the Holy Ghost power of God. And suddenly, what are Jews known for? How stingy they are. How miserly they can be. I mean, that's why they call, you know, somebody who say, man, he really Jewed me. He took advantage of me. He got the better of me. He got my money. Or These were Jews and all of a sudden. The stingiest people, perhaps on the face of the earth, are now generous. They say, look, they got all things coming. What do you need, brother? What do you need? What's your situation? What's your problem? They're ready to share. They became givers. Now, you know what? That's a sign and a wonder as well. <laughs> that might not be an outward sign like somebody gets dramatically healed, but it's a dramatic change and transformation in a person's life. When the fire falls, people change. When the Holy Spirit comes, there is transformation. Greedy people get become givers and generous. And look, here's something else that happens. I want you to notice this. These people, now remember, they came out of Judaism. Judaism is as ritualistic, dry, formal, staunch as any other dead ritualistic religion. People who were dry and formal and staunch all of a sudden get filled with holy wonder and holy awe. That's hard to do with religious people, you know. They become so familiar with things religious. That the idea of awe and reverence, you know what you become familiar with? You almost become haphazard around. It's like the reverence that you should have is not even there anymore. But I want you to notice with me, verse 43, fear came upon every soul. Now this fear is a sense of holy reverence. That's what it indicates here a sense of holy reverence williams in his new testament translation says a sense of reverence seized everyone another translates it a wholesome fear of god seized them 
No more dry, formal, staunch, just ritualistic. Now, great fear, great reverence, great awe. This was something real. This wasn't just people going through the motions. And then I want you to notice something else. Grouchy people. We're talking about people who are confirmed complainers. I, I see you pointing to yourself back there, Brother Glenn. He's, he's volunteered himself as an example. Huh? Thank you, brother. Professional powders. <laughs> people with master's degrees in miserableness. <laughs> were suddenly transformed by joy. Look with me down in verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were transformed by joy, praising God, having favor with all the people. Grouchy people were transformed. You know, Hearts have to be changed from the inside out for that to happen because it, it, it becomes so much a part of a person's nature. When you habitually mumble, grumble, complain, you're just grouchy about everything, you know. It becomes a part of your character almost. It takes the Holy Ghost fire to dislodge all of that. Maybe minister some deliverance. But to set us free from our own miserableness... <laughs> And transform our lives into the, the joyful, peaceful, praising God life that we should have. Notice verse 47. Praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. People were being saved. Lives were being transformed when the Holy Spirit came and moved in power and moved in fire. I want, to, I want us to try to imagine the transformation that this made, not only in 120 individuals, not only in the people who got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit as well, because of Paul, uh, Peter's preaching where 3,000 people got saved, but let's imagine the transformation that came over those people's families. You've got all of these. Now you've got 3,000 families. One person transformed by the power of God. Imagine the effect they had now on 3,000 families. Not only 3,000 families, 3,000 workplaces. Because the person who was miserly and grumpy and complaining all the time has now been transformed. By the Holy Spirit of God. And you know that is a sign and a wonder. And it's a testimony to all who knew what you were like before. To see the transformation that Christ made in your life. Y'all awake? Imagine the transformation when a family member. They, they had been ostracized maybe from a brother, a sister, a loved one or whatever for years. And now that family member looks him up and says... I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry for the things I told you. And I, I hope you'll find it in your heart to forgive me. Now that, you know that's what happens when the Holy Spirit moves in people's lives. Revival is more than just people shaking and trembling. Revival is when we start getting right with God and right with each other. Imagine all these people now, they're repenting before the Lord. Remember Peter's message, repent, repent every one of you. Now they're repenting before the Lord because they're recognizing their own sinfulness. And they're calling out to God for forgiveness. And now they're calling on their loved ones and friends and neighbors or co-workers or even people, maybe people they did business with that they mistreated or they cheated or they didn't. Back up something they sold to them. They promised them a warranty and then reneged. Now they're repenting. Now God's dealing with them. Now they're wanting to make things right. That's revival. That's when God starts moving in people's lives. All the old ways 
the old ways, those things die. As men and women begin to put on Christ. You know, when Christ moves in the human heart, there is transformation. No transformation, then you have to doubt the validity of their experience. If you can still lie, if you can still cuss that way, if you can still cheat people, I I, I question the validity of your Christian experience. I know businessmen who claim to be Christians, been in church for years and years, some of them charismatic churches. And yet they will lie and they will cheat and they will connive. You have to wonder. You know, Acts chapter 3, God is moving in signs and wonders supernaturally. He heals the, the Lord, uses Peter and John. They, they see the lame man at the gate of the temple. This is a man lame from birth. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, laid daily at the gate of the temple. Here's a guy never walked in his life. Now he's a grown man. Every day his family brought him there because you know what his job was? To beg for money. He sat at the temple. Surely he'll find sympathetic people passing by in, going into the temple. So that's what he did. And when he saw Peter and John about to go in, he asked them for money. Verse 3. Peter fastened his eyes on him with John and he said, look, look on us. He gave heed to them expecting, well, a few bucks, I guess. Verse 5. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I'll give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's better than a few bucks. That's better than a cheeseburger. Might not have any money, but look, here's an apple. Get you some lunch. This is better, right? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked. (coughs) Excuse me. And entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew it was him that sat and begged at the beautiful gate. And you know, a great crowd began to gather around. What happened here? And they start talking to Peter and to John, and they say, what did you do? Peter and John said, uh, verse 12, if you look there with me. When Peter saw it, he answered to the people, you men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Why do you look so earnestly on us as though we, by our own power, made this man walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer, Barnabas, to be granted unto you. And you killed the prince of life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. We didn't do it. Jesus Christ did it. The one you crucified. You laid your ungodly hands on him and crucified him. The Lord raised him up, and he's the one who healed this man. And now here's what you need to do, verse 19. Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, that when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you. That's what you need to do. Repent. And I, I want to bring you now to a verse that I consider a key verse here, not only in this passage, but in, in our whole message today. 
as Peter has preached to this crowd, you need to repent. The Lord healed this man. You crucified this Lord. The Lord raised him from the dead. And now he's healing. He's here still and he healed. And if you'll call upon him, if you'll repent and call upon him, then he says times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. And he'll send Jesus Christ, which before was preached to you. And then I want you to look with me to verse 26. He says, unto you first, he's talking to the Jews now, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Now, I want us to focus on that verse for a minute. He said he sent Jesus Christ to you first. That is to the Jew first. He sent him to bless you with lots of stuff. He, he, he sent him to bless you with financial prosperity. I want you to notice the nature of the blessing. He sent him to bless you. Verse 26. In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. He sent him to bless us by turning us away from our lifestyle of sin. That's the blessing. Let's understand that that is the blessing. Being delivered from a lifestyle of selfishness, of self-indulgence, of sin. That's the blessing. How have we come to the place that we are now where we equate stuff with God's blessing? It's how much we have. That's what proves God's blessed us. It's how much we own. It's how much we've accumulated. That's the proof that God's blessed us, right? I mean, that's what we think. That's what America thinks. That's what many Christians have come to think. The, the evidence of God's blessing is how much money you make, how new is your car, how successful is your job, your business, your career. That's what we equate with the blessing of God. Let me tell you, that's, that's the wrong measure. You're using the wrong measure. The measure is He sent Him to bless us that we might be turned away from our sins. Sin has been the source of our problem all along. <laughs> Sin has made us miserable creatures. That's what we have to recognize. We've been so self-absorbed, so, so selfish, so wicked, so proud, so arrogant. Seekers, really, only of our own pleasure and people who have become impossible to please. And that's why... Our nation is in the state that it's in today. That's why so many people are divorced. It's why so many people don't even bother to get married because they'll just try people out for a while. And when I get tired of you, you're gone. Sin has made us miserable. Sin's been the problem all along. And the Lord came to bless us by delivering us from sin, by delivering us from a lifestyle of sin, by, by delivering us from sinful actions, sinful thoughts, sinful words. I like the way the Williams Version translates Acts 3.26. Let me read it to you. It was to you first that he sent his servant, after raising him from the dead, to bless you by causing every one of you to turn from his wicked ways. He sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. You know when a person just a, let's let's take a mother for instance who comes to Christ, gets saved, gets blessed by being transformed, by being turned away from her wicked ways. Then that mother is not only blessed herself, but now she becomes a tremendous blessing to all of her family. Because she's been transformed. She's been changed. She is now an agent of blessing. The same thing is true for a father. 
I mean, some of you could testify the kind of father you were before you got saved. And then what happened when the Lord blessed you by turning you away from your sins and selfishness and drunkenness and meanness and cruelty and grouchiness and so on and so forth. You know, there are a lot of people who think they're blessed because they've got a lot of money. But I'm telling you, money doesn't make you blessed because you can have money and still be a miserable human being. And you can be miserable to be around. So full of yourself, so arrogant, so proud, so mean, cruel tongue. Oh, I'm blessed because you got plenty of money. That doesn't make you blessed. What makes a person blessed? Here's, here's how the Lord blesses us. He turns us away from our sins. He turns us away. He delivers us from the sinner that we used to be and transforms us and changes us entirely from the inside. The signs and wonders begin on the inside. The mean man becomes kind. The cruel man becomes compassionate. The stingy become generous. You know, if you have been turned around, turned away from the sinner that you used to be, then you really are blessed. If you've been delivered from the depravity that once characterized your life, the sinfulness, the sinful pursuits, the sin that once caused you great pleasure, the Lord delivered you from those things, your life has been transformed, you are blessed. We need to recognize just how blessed we are. We need to recognize this because the way to stay blessed is to stay close to the Lord. Are you a lover of truth, a lover of the Word of God, a lover of Christ, a lover of the assembly of the saints? Then you are blessed. Do you love your family? Do you really love your family, love each other? You are really, really blessed. Really blessed. So don't get sucked back into the world. Don't let the world seduce you. You know, it's got many, many seductions, and it's always trying to pull you back. The world is like an octopus with so many arms you can't count them. And all of those arms are always, those tentacles are trying to grab you and and pull you back into the world. The world is very, very seductive. And it's always whispering in your ear. You know, if you'll just compromise a little bit, bend your scruples a little bit, Just here and there, just think how much more money you could make. As though that extra money is going to be a blessing. The blessing is in being turned away from your sins. Let's remember this always. Because the blessing doesn't come in just making more money. What does it cost you? What will you have to forfeit? You see, it's possible to make more money, but forfeit the blessing. The blessing of being turned away from your sins. The world calls you in. You know what the world will whisper in your ear? Go ahead and indulge yourself. You know, you've been good for too long. You really need to let your head down. Really enjoy yourself. Let go. Have a good time. Come out drinking with us or come out partying with us. Smoke a little bit of this or whatever. A little bit of self-indulgence. It'll it'll do you good. You'll feel so much better about yourself. So you gratify the flesh and forfeit the blessing. Because the blessing, remember, what's the blessing? Being turned away from your sins. Why would you go back to sin now and forfeit the very blessing that Christ said he came for? God blessed you by taking you out of those sins. Do not be seduced back into them. I know that life can get hard. Life is not always a a bed of roses. I know that sometimes you pray, things don't always change immediately. I know that trials can drag on and on and on. Prayer doesn't seem like it's getting answered. Look, even in New Testament times, things were hard for the apostles. We, we've, we've looked at chapter 2, we looked at chapter 3. In chapter 4 of Acts, persecutions broke out against the church. Now here they were, walking in the blessings of God, Right? Chapter 4, persecutions break out and things begin getting much harder than they were before. The popularity that the church once had, that began to wane. In fact, somebody pulled the plug on and it drained out so that they weren't as popular as they used to be. 
Now the authorities were rising up against them. Some of the apostles were arrested. They were uh, tried. They were thrown in prison. They were threatened. I mean, these weren't idle threats either. Life as a Christian became much more difficult. The way following Christ became a lot harder wasn't as easy as it was before. And it's not always easy for you and me, but it is always possible because the Lord's always with us. He's always for us. I want you to notice what they did when the way got hard, when things got difficult, when the world conspired against them. I want you to notice what they did. I'm in Acts 4 now, and I'm going to read in verse 23. They were threatened. They were arrested. They were let go from prison. Here's the first thing they did. How they dealt with the trial, the adversity. Verse 23, being let go, they went to their own company. They assembled together. That's the first thing they did. They assembled together with those of like precious faith. They reported all that the chief priests and elders had done to them. Down in verse 31, it mentions again that the place, when they prayed, the the place was shaken where they were assembled together. There's an interesting emphasis in both of these verses, verse 23 and verse 31, on the fact that they assembled together. You know, there's strength in the assembly. We, We actually do draw strength one from another. We're encouraged by one another. We pray one for another. Uh, the church assembly is a very special place because the Lord is, uh, He's Lord of the candlesticks. The Bible says He walks in the midst of the candlesticks, walks in the midst of the church. We meet the Lord in a very special way in the church assembly. They assembled. Now some people start going through trouble. You know the first thing they do? They skip out on the assembly. Things aren't going so well. The way gets hard. Things get difficult. <clears throat> I'm not going to church. They get discouraged. The the first thing you need to remember is you gather with those of like precious faith and get back in the fire. Let some of their fire burn you again, get you flaming up again. Because, you know, the fire starts waning low. You got to get back in the fire to get get the fire going again. Hello. You take a piece of charcoal out of the fire and just leave it by itself. It's just going to go out. Got to put it back in the fire. Let it get red hot again. They assembled together. Here's something else they did. Verse 24. They prayed. They, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. They said, Lord, thou art God that made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. You read the rest of this passage. They poured out their hearts to the Lord. They prayed. When the Trials get tough. The way gets hard. Don't quit praying. Don't just shrug your shoulders and resign yourself. Things are getting bad. Oh, well, I guess that's just the way it's going to be. No, you pray. You call out to the God who made the heavens and the earth. Y'all, y'all awake still, right? We have to push ourselves. Remember, you call out to God. You pray. You assemble, you pray, and notice something else. They stayed strong in the Lord and and in the Word. They rehearsed, actually, their confidence in the Word of God. I I like this, down in verse 29. I'm going to read verse 29 and 30. Now, part of their prayer, notice, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. He's talking about these Jews, uh, the the elders, the priests, and so forth, that were threatened. Behold their threatenings. Threatenings, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Notice this. They they knew how important the word was, that the word had to be preached, that the word had to be held on to, the word had to be made, made known. I like that emphasis there, that emphasis on the word of God, that that absolute confidence that they are expressing in the word of God. The power of God, you know, it, it resides in the Word of God. Romans 1.16, it's the power of God unto salvation. Amen. So, Lord, make us bold that we would preach your Word and, and stretch forth your hand 
to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. The result, verse 31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. You know, you could really spend, I guess, a good bit of time expanding on verse 31. But I would like to draw your attention to one thing. And that one thing is this, that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and, and spoke the Word of God, you know, with boldness, without apology. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Wait, they were filled with the Holy Ghost already. These people were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, and we saw what the Lord was doing there. The same people are filled with the Holy Spirit again. Uh, this is the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, Spirit-filled. Uh, how is it that they would have to be filled again? I love Dave Prentice's answer to that. He says, we leak. <laughs> Why would you have to be filled again? We leak. And look, that's a fact. We are leaky vessels. You know, we are earthen vessels, the Bible says, and we know we are imperfect vessels. We all have our cracks and flaws and so forth. Uh, we're in content, we, we all have a continuous need to be refilled. We really do. Even the hottest fire will burn lower over time if fresh fuel is not added. That hot, no matter how hot it is, it's going to burn lower and burn lower unless you put more fuel into the fire. That's true with your fireplace. It's true with your campfire. It's true with a, a forest fire or a house on fire. Doesn't matter how hot it burns, it's going to burn down. And if more fuel isn't added, it's going to keep getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And the truth is that even the best of us leak. The apostles themselves were refilled, refreshed. And, and we too, we talk about revival, we too need revival. That's why we must come back to the fire. We can't allow ourselves to grow weak, to grow spiritually dull. Uh, we must come back to the fire. We must re re be refreshed before the Lord in the presence of the Lord. We, we all need revival. You know what revival actually means? To live again. To, re to live again. It means to resuscitate. You know, like a person who, who uh, had a heart attack, that their heart's not beating anymore, and they chung them with the... Electricity, whatever they call those things, I forget. Defibrillators. Get their heart started again. A drowning man is pulled out of the water and they give him CPR, get the heart going again. It means to live again. You know what else it means? It means to rekindle a fire. A fire that has burned low. That's what revival actually means. To rekindle a fire, to cause something to live again. <clears throat> and we need, we need fuel added to our fire so that it burns and blazes once again. It, it, it means coming back to the fire, beloved. We sang a song today, uh, a Keith Green song. Keith Green was a musician and a composer, he died back in 1982, but wrote some tremendous songs that affected my life in my early days with the Lord. Back in the 70s, he came out with an album called No Compromise. <clears throat> and uh, one of the songs on that album was the song we sang this morning, My Eyes Are Dry. My eyes are dry, my faith is old. My heart is hard, my prayers are cold. Now, I I I'll tell you, when that song first came out, we were a little reluctant to sing it. Because it seemed like, you know, that's a pretty bad confession. <laughs> my heart is hard. I'm saying my heart is hard. My eyes are dry. Uh, you know, dry, that is no tears, no weeping over sin. No weeping over the lost. But the more I heard that song, the more I realized 
You know, my eyes are drier than they ought to be. My heart is harder than it ought to be. My prayers are colder than they ought to be. My faith is older than it ought to be. Older in the sense that where is the fresh testimony of God's presence, God's power? I used to play that album in my hairstyling shop. (laughs) But I'll tell you what. I think it's a song I can sing now with gusto. Knowing that I'm a leaky vessel and that I need God's fire today, just like we all need God's fire today. We all leak. The fervor, the passion, the intensity, uh, love for God, love for each other, those things can be affected when we leak, when we leak, when the fire burns low. Uh, Even the Bible warns in the last days, the Lord himself spoke of a time when the love of most would wax cold. So faith can can lose its fervor. It can lose its passion. Our love for Christ can wax cold, uh, just as the Lord himself warned. He said, because of abounding iniquity, the love of most would wax cold. You, you know what happens? As, as vessels that, that leak, our love for the Lord, you know, he's supposed to be our first love, right? Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We love the Lord with all of our heart then you know what? If we do that, everything else is right. You don't have any trouble loving your spouse. You don't have any trouble loving your children like you're supposed to or even your aggravating brother-in-law. You know, you can deal with them. When your love is right with the Lord, when you love Him with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, you don't have trouble with these other things. Even the things that would irritate you you can deal with, you can overcome when you love the Lord like you're supposed to. But when we leak, let me tell you what starts to happen. And and I, I know you know this, but first of all, you're not on your spiritual toes like you used to be. Things that you used to filter and things that you used to trap. I mean, the thought might have came to your head, but... You trapped it before it came out of your mouth. But when we start to leak, things that you used to catch, now you just let it go. Now you find yourself saying things that you would not have said before. You tell people things you would not have told them before. Now an attitude has come back. An attitude that was crucified long ago, your your life was transformed, the fire came through and, and radically changed you, and now there's a chip on your shoulder again. Now it's now you're irritable you're irritable. Hello. Amen. You know when we leak, we change. We begin to change. We reflect less and less of Christ and more and more of self. We start letting things go that we used to catch. I mean, now we listen to music we wouldn't have listened to before. Or we're watching things on TV. You know you shouldn't be watching that. But now we, we let stuff go. We, we, we've leaked. And the Holy Spirit isn't burning as hot in us as it once did. Amen. There's a spiritual dullness that begins to take over. And now you've copped attitudes with people. You're aggravated with your other brothers and sisters. Now you're having exchanging words with family members, your own husband or wife. Come on. on. You know, the Lord told the church at Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, He said, "You've you've lost your first love. You, you know what? I want you to look with me over to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. 
Very quickly, if you would, I would like for us to read a couple of verses together. Revelation chapter 2. When, when our relationship with the Lord is right, then we don't have the trouble overcoming. We really don't. Revelation 2, beginning in verse 1, Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now the candlesticks, this represented the churches of Revelation. Each church was a candlestick or a lampstand. And I want you to notice the Lord walks in the midst of those lampstands. The Lord is always in the very midst of his church. He said, I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you can't bear those that are evil. And you've tried them which say they're apostles and are not. You found them liars. So this church has some discernment. You have borne and had patience and for my name's sake have labored and have not fainted. You've got some endurance. Nevertheless, I have something against you because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, unless you repent. I want you to notice he says something here. You have left your first love. You did it. You did it. It's your fault. You left. Now... Nobody can be blamed for you losing your first love. I know people always try to put the blame on others. Well, you know, this one said something to me and that and that one offended me or, or this one hurt my feelings. Jesus puts the blame on us. You, you left your first love. You left your first love. He says, I know your works, the good, the bad and the ugly. But. You know, just to paraphrase here, he says, I also know that something changed in you. Your heart's not the same. The heart, we're to love the Lord with all our heart, you know, all our heart, heart, soul, mind and strength. First and greatest commandment, we're to love him with full and complete devotion. But he's saying something's happened to your heart. You love the Lord with all your heart, loving your neighbor is not a problem. You don't have the attitude. You don't have the difficulty. Loving your husband, loving your wife, it's not a problem. Amen. But when you backslide, when you leak, you lose your tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Then all that old fleshly stuff starts to resurface again. That cruel tongue comes back. The meanness comes out. You know what you need? Revival. Amen. You need to come back to the fire. Uh, I like what the old 19th century evangelist Gypsy Smith said. He said, it's very simple, he said. You draw a circle on the ground. You stand in the middle of it. And then you make sure, this is your job, make sure everything inside that circle is right with God. <laughs> That's where it starts. He told the church here, repent. Revelation 2, verse 5, repent. Repent and remember. You know, repentance is simply, uh, hey, we could start with, Lord, my eyes are dry. My faith is old. My heart is hard. My prayers are cold. Lord, I'm not the man I ought to be. Alive to you. Dead to me. Lord Jesus, I repent. You know, it's just coming back to your father like the prodigal son. He recognized he had strayed away, came to his senses. Let's come to our senses. You know, when you leak, 
and then the world starts enticing you into the old ways, you, you, let's remember you're forfeiting the blessings. You're not getting blessings by, oh, I'm indulging in the world now. Oh, 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 oh look at how, how blessed I am now. You're losing the blessing. The blessing, the blessing is the Lord delivered you from your sins. He delivered you from yourself, your selfishness. You go back to that stuff, you start getting selfish again. You wind up destroying your life, your family, your home, your happiness. He says, repent. And he says, remember. Also in verse 5, remember from whence thou art fallen. So let's remember that key verse that the blessing, Acts 3 in verse 26, the blessing is that the Lord Jesus sent, came to bless us by turning us away from our iniquities. That's where the blessing is. Go back into sin, you forfeit your blessing. Turn to the Lord with all of your heart. Repent of your sins. Be transformed by His Holy Spirit and be blessed. That's where the blessing is. Old Gypsy Smith said, you make sure everything inside that circle that you write around yourself is right with God. There's a good place to start. Am I right with God? Am I completely right with God? What, what sin am I holding on to? What have I kept reserved for my own self-indulgence? Have I repented of all of my sins? Lord Jesus, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, make me the man I need to be. Lord, Lord, I want to come back to your fire. I want to come back to your fire. I want to be refreshed, renewed, reinvigorated, new wind in my sails. Holy Spirit, fall on me afresh. Fill me afresh. I don't want to be a, a, a leaked out vessel. I, I want to be full to overflowing. How about we do... What A.W. Tozer said, you know, the essence of revival is to get right with God and get right with each other. Amen. You get right. There is no revival. No revival is taking place if you still have the attitudes. If you're still mad at somebody, if you're still holding on to those grudges and that resentment and all that. No, there's been no revival. Because revival means you are getting right with God and you're getting right with one another. That means you get right with your family first and foremost. Get right. Get right with them. You hurt somebody, you injured somebody, or they injured you, then you forgive them. You let it go. Let the injuries go. Let the offenses go. Pray genuinely one for another. Ask them to forgive you. You forgive them. Get right with God. Get right with each other. The essence of real revival. Make sure everything inside that circle is right with God. Amen. Ask once more for the Holy Spirit to just sweep over you. I don't think you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost all over again. But you know, we do need to be refilled. <laughs> we do need to be refilled. So Lord, we pray today. That you would fill us afresh, fill us anew, Lord Jesus. Lord, we confess that we are flawed and cracked and leaking vessels. We confess, Lord, that we've allowed things to come back, to creep back in, things that we didn't used to tolerate. Lord, we've allowed attitudes and words and, and other things, Lord. Lord Jesus, forgive us, wash us, cleanse us. As we come back to the fire, Lord, of your presence, the fire of your presence, Lord, we confess to you, Lord, that our eyes are dry. Lord Jesus, grant us tears. Lord, grant us fresh faith, fresh testimonies of your faithfulness. Lord, let our hearts be delivered from coldness. Lord, soften them, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Lord, wash us clean with your blood. Fill us afresh, Lord, we pray. As the psalmist said, till our cup runneth over, Lord. Lord, transform us from the inside out. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Amen. amen.